Good morning, everyone, and good evening, Steve. Yes, uh, welcome good to the CGPP Friday seminar. It's nice seeing you all. Uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Professor Steve Chen. Professor Chen is College Professor of Distinction at the University of Colorado Boulder in the United States. His research interests cover international relations, the economy, foreign policy, decision making, and East Asia. He has received many academic awards, including the, the Distinguished Scholar Award given by the Foreign Policy Analysis Section of the International Studies Association. He has published 20 books and about 180 articles and chapters. His articles appear in top journals in our field, such as APSR, Comparative Political Study, EJR, ISQ, JCR, Journal of Peace Research and the Security Studies and World Politics. His books have been published by leading academic prizes such as Cambridge, Michigan, Stanford. I will not uh, introduce all the titles because if I do, we will not have time for his speech. Uh, but I would like to mention a forthcoming book entitled Contesting Revisionism, China, US, and the Transformation of International Order at the Oxford University Press. It's a very special book for me because I'm honored to be one of the co-author of the book. So today, Professor Chen will talk about power, an enduring topic in political science for about 30 minutes. Then we will start the Q&A. If you would like to ask a question, please use the conversation function of team to let me know. Thank you. So without further ado, Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kai. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, honored to be here. And uh, I thank uh, Kai for inviting me, giving me this chance to meet everyone virtually online. And I also thank uh, Ms. McDonald, Angela, for, uh, for being so helpful in organizing, uh, making arrangements for, 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 this, uh, for this talk. So thank you, Angela. And Kai, of course, you are in charge. So um, cut me off, cut me off, off at uh, 30 minutes, even if I don't get to the finish line. <laughs> I, I would really be very much uh, uh, looking forward to, uh, to exchanges, questions and answers. You know, I, uh, I uh, would very much like to learn from the audience. Uh, before I start, I want to also thank all the, uh, all the people participating online because uh, you are taking valuable time from your daily schedules and I understand how busy people are. So again, I'm grateful for you to, uh, to come and attend, uh, attend this forum. Uh, the talk that I have today is, is focused on an age old concept, a very common, pervasive, important concept that many people have struggled with and that concept is power. Um, what is power? How do we go about conceptualizing power and measuring power? Uh, it's an intellectual journey that is still incomplete. It reflects to a large extent my own personal frustration and disappointment. And to my chagrin, as I get older and coming close to my career, uh, I kind of have this cynical, maybe overly pessimistic sense that much of the work that we have seen in publications in our discipline may be built um, quicksand. They are castles on the sand in the sense that the data that they use to test hypotheses and develop theories, uh, that data tend to be quite weak and problematic as you will see. So, is another confession, personal confession, I want to say that I myself have not come to any satisfactory answer to the topic that I will share with you today, namely conceptions of power. Uh, I started uh, being very intrigued by the theories of balance of power and power transition. And that started me to start looking for valid measures of national power. And I'm still very much struggling with this challenge. And I hope that maybe you can help me uh, to think through some of the difficult problems. 
So with the remaining time, what I would like to do is to give you a long introduction, a long introduction about the problems of the data involving the measurement of national power, and then move on to talk about conceptualizations of the power. And as I have said, I have myself not come to a totally satisfactory answer, and this is still an incomplete journey, and I very much look forward to your feedback. So, Kai, let's just move to the next slide. Uh, what I would argue is that before we can do anything in terms of explaining international relations, we need to have good data, valid data, because otherwise our explanations would not be very good. And as I have just said before, uh, my key interest is in measuring national power. And given this measurement, we may be able to look for, for example, when does a power transition take place, the timing of power transition. Yet here, I think we are plagued by some very challenging data problems. Uh, let me begin with a study in the Security Studies Journal, Journal of Security Studies by Karsten Rauch. Uh, he introduced two very familiar indicators of national power, one based on gross domestic product, which uh, the granddaddies of power transition favorite, Ogansky, AFK Ogansky, and Yasser Kugler, in their well-known and much deserved uh, book uh, called uh, the, the War Ledger, argue that GDP provides the most succinct indicator of national power. And the other indicator that Rauch introduced uh, has the acronym CINC, uh, the Composite Indicator of National Capabilities. For those of you who are familiar with COWN, C-O-W, the, the Colonist of War uh, Project, you know that this is a composite indicator based on total population, urban population, steel production, energy consumption, defense budget, and the number of military personnel six indicators combined sync and that sync is another very commonly used indicator of national power besides gdp the problem comes up is that when when we use these two indicators they give us very different uh pictures of what's going on in international relations specifically about uh a question that i am very much interested in that is to say, is there a power transition going on? And if so, when? In the case of the US overtaking Britain, UK, according to GDP measure, uh, that overtaking took place in the 1870s. But if you were to use the CINC, SYNC data, uh, the overtaking took place in 1890s. Now, this is not a small matter. The reason is that very much of the explanation for the peacefulness of this overtaking has been based on the argument that the United States was a non-revisionist power. It was a satisfied, satisfied power. And that's why, even though it was a late rising power, its overtaking of Britain did not result in war according to the power transition. Yet, uh, if the overtaking took place in Around the 1890s, then, there was clearly a war of aggression uh, launched by the United States against Spain, seeking to evict Spain from the Western Hemisphere, taking over uh, Cuba, Guam, uh, and Puerto Rico, for example. So the timing of the overtaking is important. And this is just one illustration. Rahul also showed us that if one were to look at GDP, as a measure of national power, then Germany and Russia never overtook the United States. At its height, Germany only reached 77% of the United States GDP. As for Russia slash the Soviet Union, even at its peak, Moscow never matched United States GDP, not even half. The best it could do was 44%. So in that sense, then one can very reasonably ask whether or not uh, the concept of bipolarity even applied to the Cold War era, because clearly uh, the Soviet Union was not nearly as 
powerful as the United States, not even half. And even more controversially, perhaps, according to GDP measure, nominal GDP, uh, according to Rauch, China reached parity with the United States in 2005. Now, that I don't know what kind of data he used, but that doesn't seem to make sense to me at all. Uh, more if you were to look down toward the bottom part of this uh, table, according to SYNC, Rauch says that the US, USSR was the most powerful country between the years of 1971 and 1988, and that China had already overtaken the United States from the year 1996. And in all these cases of power transitions, uh, the outcome had been peaceful. Now you can understand uh, why I went through these indicators in these cases, because some of the conclusions very much uh, strain our credibility. And obviously, because these two indicators have been widely used, they also suggest that many of the conclusions reached by the common run-of-the-mill quantitative studies of international relations may very well be built on the basis of soft sand, that the results cannot be trusted. Hi, if we can move on to the next slide, I want to give a few more examples. This is a long introduction to my talk about uh, conceptualization. Uh, let me use another example. Net Lebeau and Benjamin Valentino. They argue that a, a good way to measure national power would be GDP multiplied by population. Now, I myself have some questions about the legitimacy of such an approach, but they made their argument that this is the most sensible uh, way to approach to measure, measuring national power. And according to them, Spain was the dominant power until of, I'm sorry, not until from 1640 until it was over, overtaken by Russia in 1715, that the United States became the dominant power in the world in 1895 until it was overtaken. And here is something that I think many of you will raise your eyebrows. According to Lebo and Valentino, China had been the world's most powerful country from the late 1970s on. And again, the point is very simply this, depending on what measure you use, you will come up with very, very different conclusions, right? Uh, and again, if you were to use the measure by Lebeau and Valentino then, uh, there had never been a war between the country overtaken and the one that is overtaking it. Uh, most recently, Beckley in an article in uh, in international security argue that the best way to measure national power will be GDP multiplied by GDP per capita. Uh, GDP refers to size, whereas GDP per capita refers to efficiency, right? Uh, he argues that uh, looking just at the size of GDP or the size of anything does not give you a sense of how powerful a country really is. Any example used, of course, uh, again, refers to China. As late as the 1890s, according to some measures, China still had the world's largest GDP, of course, population and the military. And of course, that was in the middle of the century of humiliation. Again, what I'm trying to say, obviously, is that these measures are highly misleading. Uh, and contradicts our common sense view of who is more powerful. Uh, again, Kai, if you can just move to the next slide. The next one slide um, gives you two of my concerns. Number one is that leaders are forward looking. They try to project power, um, project how well they are going to be able to do in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And also it is after their perceptions that matters in foreign policy, not objective quote unquote indicators of sync or GDP. Uh, in this case, a good example of what I'm trying to think about is an article by uh, Bill Wolfler in World Politics on Russia's power uh, before World War I, just on the eve of World War 
uh, according to Singh, Germany and Russia were in parity, right? Uh, just before, before July 1914. And Bill Wolfer went to diplomatic archives and tried to get those decision makers perceptions of Russian power just before the war broke up. And what he found is that adversaries, namely Germany and Austria-Hungary tended to persistently, consistently underestimate Russian power, whereas the allies, the French especially, uh, tended to overestimate Russian power. More importantly, uh, the Russians themselves saw themselves to be much weaker than others' attributions. So what I'm trying to say here again is that uh, there's a huge discrepancy between subjective perceptions, even for the decision makers of the country involved, and quote unquote objective indicators such as SIG. And indeed, Germany's uh, estimation of future, future Russian growth, uh, projection into the future, uh, tended to be too, too pessimistic for the Germans and too optimistic for the Russians. That is to say, Russia never really fulfilled the expectation on the part of Berlin that it would rise and overtake Germany, which was ostensibly uh, the preventive motivation on the part of Berlin, on the part of Germany to wage World War I and again World War II. So again, uh, what we find when the rubber meets the road, perceptions by the leaders themselves do not correspond to the indicators we commonly use, in this case, sync. Can I go on, let's go to the next one, uh, next slide. So what does that take me? Um, it, 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 it tells me then we better go back to square one, uh, start, starting from scratch and think carefully and systematically about what we mean by, by power and how do we go about conceptualizing power. And today I'm taking a page from two sociologists from France, French sociologists, Boudin and Morigot, and also the writings of Ashley Tellis, uh, an American Indian political scientist. And these folks, these colleagues, suggest that there are at least three ways to think about power, and maybe there are additional ways. And here is the, bulk, the body of my presentation today. They argue that the first one is power as resources, then power as ability, and finally power as outcome. So let's go to the next slide. Let's go over the first conception of power as resources. And this is perhaps the one conception that we are most familiar with. Uh, it treats a state's assets as something that a state owns or possesses. And, and this conception only looks at assets as tangible stocks of material, quantifiable material, and not power as actual performance. So in this conception, then, each state is a unit bordered by, uh, it's a self-contained self -contained unit, um, as Ashley Tellus would say, bordered power containers. It's self-contained, you know, into the, this container we have stuff, quote unquote stuff, like how many engineers you produce, how many graduate students you educate, how much steel do you produce, what's your GMP and how much you export, and how many people are in your army, right? Now, all these are quote unquote assets, uh, could you refer to potential capacity to do something, right? To take certain actions, to exercise certain options. But the key word here is potential not realized, but potential capacity, the potential to utilize these resources, quantifiable material, whether it's engineers, graduate students, uh, the, num the number of tanks or the amount of steel or the money in the bank that could be used to, uh, to, to pursue certain policies. So how as resources then does not actually take us to where we want to end up with because having resources, possessing or only resources is itself not enough, even though, and here's the point, even though sometimes having some resources do matter, this possession can influence others' behavior. For example, if a country has nuclear weapons, then it obviously alters and shapes other countries' uh, reactions to it, right, to the owner of nuclear weapons. But still, but still, 
uh, power as resources does not take us very far, right? And this is the approach that most people, including myself, have taken in measuring national power. The examples that I've given you, looking at GDP or sink, very much is based on this conception of power as power as resources. Next slide, please. Hi. So there are some advantages and disadvantages to pursue this approach, right? Power as resources. Uh, it gives us standard quantifiable indicators like GDP, per capita income, or sink. It allows cross-national and longitudinal comparisons, but it misses also some very important aspects of power, uh, the, the less tangible, the more qualitative aspects of power, such as soft power, entrepreneurship, right? Uh, and moreover, I think more disturbingly, um, if we look to, to the past, it seemed to me at least that the countries that emerged to the very top of the international hierarchy, uh, these tend not to be the countries with the biggest size bulk. Uh, it is to begin with a little country called Portugal that became the world's uh, most powerful country, uh, the first global power, if you will, right? Portugal certainly did not have size in terms of territory, population, or military establishment. Um, following Portugal, it would be the Netherlands that succeeded Portugal to be the next global hegemon. And after, of course, the Netherlands, we all know it was Britain. And again, compare, comparing Britain with France and Russia, uh, Britain was good, didn't have size, right? So what I'm trying to say is that the gazelles, the gazelles which would adapt, adapt agile, they run circles around the elephants, the whales, right? It's not the Chinas, the Indias, the Russias, uh, or for that matter, France, that became the global power, but rather the gazelles, which were very, very adaptable, that had entrepreneurial elan, that had robust institutions, right? Uh, that became the world's dominant power. And in the age of globalization, of course, and cross-border production chains and so on and so forth, um, the, the, the conception of power as resources that each country is a unit unto itself, an island unto itself, is increasingly, in my view, unsustainable, that this vision of power simply does not match with the reality of the world that we live in. Moreover, one more thing, that uh, the typical approach to measure every country, every country's power is also, I think, uh, misleading because when we look to the, to the past wars, for example, World War I, World War II. Uh, in some respects, the British could not match the Germans. The Germans had more people, right? The Germans had a stronger, uh, at least land, uh, land army, right? Infantry. Yet Britain prevailed in part because it has stronger allies, uh, particularly the United States. And of course, if you were to simply look at Britain per se, Britain as a unit, you overlook the fact that there's something called the British Dominion or the British Empire. After all, the Indians, the Australians, the Nepalese, uh, all fought on the British side. So if you were to use the unit of analysis called the British Empire, Brit British Dominion, Britain did not look as weak as power transition theory would argue, at least compared to Germany for both world wars. So again, the unit of analysis, the accounting unit matters, right? Whether it's alliances or um, the Commonwealth, for example. So next, next slide. So moving on to the next second conceptual, second conception of power, it is power as ability, not possessing resources, but what do you do with the resources that you have? Here the key is activation, right? Having, just having resources is not enough, but you need to activate or mobilize or uh, operationalize, if you will, the resources that you have. Um, here then, when you talk about activation, you're talking about intentionality. What do you do with the resources at your disposal? Right? Here is then a very important dimension, I think, at the economy. 
between active utilization of the resources that you have versus the potential capacity to pursue certain options. Uh, the, the latter, of course, refers to power as resources. Here, then, there are three things, at least to me, that makes a great deal of sense. Uh, when we talk about power as ability, we're talking about policy capacity. A country's ability to, to, first of all, extract resources. The resources are in society, but you must be able to extract, take these resources from society. And to do that, the second thing you have to do is penetration. You have to reach society, deeply touch society, right? And thirdly, conversion. How do you intend to use the resources that you have seized, you have extracted? What do you do with them? And none of these three things can be taken for granted. Uh, wars are often won by those that have more effective mobilization and are able to deploy the resources much more effectively. So that, for example, Israel prevailed over the Arab countries, which were large in terms of size, population, army, defense budget, right? Uh, Russia, even though it's, it has bulk size, lost both world wars uh, because of its inefficiencies, its inability to extract, penetrate, and convert. Uh, whereas Japan, was able to acquit itself much better during World War II. Even though it was eight to nine times weaker than the United States, Japan was, at least for a period of time, a short period of time, able to, um, to still make the United States. Of course, in the end, uh, Japan was not able to overcome its much smaller resource base, even though it extracted and mobilized resources much more effectively. And of course, even without, uh, even with US aid, I should say, South Vietnam was much lower in its policy capacity compared to North Vietnam. And that explain, explains the outcome of the Vietnam War. The, the key idea here is leakage, right? Even when a country has lots of resources, these resources can leak in the sense of being wasted or used inefficiently, or uh, even siphoned off by, uh, by, by people who are uh, by corruption, right? By graft. Uh, a good example of that would be the oil rich Gulf states. They're wealthy, they have high per capita income, but much of the resources uh, have not been put to good effective use. So here again is a good thing. So I'm struggling right now. How do you go about uh, operationalize policy capacity, right? Extraction, penetration, and conversion. The next slide, please. Uh, there are some some cross-national uh, indicators that one can employ um, to kind of draw um, the, the, the ideas of extraction, right? Mobilization and conversion. Uh, one idea of extraction is taxation. Do states rely on direct taxes or indirect taxes? Even in the United States, I don't know about, about Australia, even in the United States, certain states rely very much on individual or corporate income tax. Other states don't have income tax, but rely on sales tax uh, or property tax. Obviously, countries that can extract direct income tax are much more efficient, much more effective. Uh, among those countries that seek to tax income, uh, their ability varies greatly. In Sweden, you can count on every suite automatically, voluntarily paying their taxes, whereas in Italy, this expectation probably is not too realistic, right? So there's a great deal of uh, variation across countries in terms of a state's ability to extract. Um, the next question is penetration. And here I've been also thinking, how do you go about uh, Operationalizing the idea of penetration. Um, one possibility is the underground economy, right? Underground economy in the sense of sales of marijuana or other drugs, uh, prostitution, uh, illegal gambling, right? To what extent the, the state can actually capture revenues from the underground economy? Labor participation rate is another good indicator. What is the extent of your workforce working for the legal open 
economy, right? Uh, in the case of the United States, maybe there's underemployment rate of 15%. 15% of the workforce does not participate in the regular, quote, regular economy. Another uh, indicator of penetration could be high school enrollment. In many, many countries, even though it's secondary school education is mandatory, the enroll, enrollment figure is very low. Uh, finally, conversion. How can leaders effectively uh, allocate resources, right? Uh, much of the resources that they, 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 they extract from society are already pre-committed. In the case of the United States, 50, 60% of federal money has already been committed, committed to entitlement programs. Uh, in the case of the United States, just to use another example, uh, the president of the United States does not have the authority to order uh, vaccines for, for states, to mandate states to give vaccine shots for, for the virus, for COVID-19, uh, or mandating uh, wearing masks. The, so power is highly decentralized in the case of the United States. Uh, and there are very many points, veto groups can block, can block uh, policy execution. The 50 governors, for example, issue their own orders uh, about how to combat uh, COVID-19, whether or not to, to order lockdown or open the economy. Uh, social cohesion is another thing, right? Uh, in the case of combating, uh, combating COVID-19, China probably has, has an edge in terms of social cohesion, all right? In, uh, a unitary government, okay? Uh, authoritarian approach to mandating, dictating uh, solutions, political solutions to, to deal with the pandemic in comparison to say a more democratic India, right? Uh, and, you know, it is more difficult for you and me perhaps to imagine in Singapore, or South Korea or Taiwan that people would protest against the mandate from the government to wear face masks uh, on the grounds that uh, such an order infringes on their personal liberties. Whereas in, in the case of the United States, this sort of protest is not so unimaginable. So here again, I think uh, one has to take into account uh, where the rubber meets the road, that is to say conversion. Even when you have the resources, you are able to extract resources. How are you going to convert these resources to effective policy? And that cannot be taken for granted. So what I'm saying is that there are a few links between the possession ownership of resources to actually controlling outcomes. Kai, can we move on to the next one? Am I close to, to time? Am I yes, time? No, no worries. Yeah, no worries. You sure? Yeah. Okay, cut me off if I'm if I'm over over no, no uh, spending yeah. too much time. Uh, let me move on to the third conception of power, which is power as outcome. Here, I think we are really coming close to what we really mean by power, which is the ability to control over outcome, right? And it stretches the inherently important idea that power is always relational. You cannot talk power in the abstract. It's always power of A versus, versus B, right? A wants to get B to do something that B would not otherwise uh, want to do. And since time is relatively short, let me just emphasize two things, two things. Uh, first, this conception of power as outcome requires counterfactual reason. We have to ask what what B would have done in the absence of A's attempt to influence B, right? So counterfactually, but how history would have been different had A not tried to change B? And most people do not get to that level. And the second thing that I want to say is that uh, there is something called self-selection that uh, we need to take into account. And by self-selection, I mean the following, okay? If you just allow me to give you an example. If I have a disagreement with someone, if that someone is 270 pounds and six feet five, that I will walk away. Even though I have a dispute with this person, I will walk away because I know if I got into a fight with this person, I'll be beaten up. So here is then I am self-selecting myself out of a confrontation, out of an encounter. This encounter, this fight never took place because I walked away. So what is that important? 
Because in international relations, we do not typically take into account when countries walk away from an encounter. Let me give you an example that I will move on. I know time is short. Let's say, let's say, United States has a known policy against nuclear proliferation. All other countries know that Washington DC is opposed to nuclear proliferation, including South Korea and Taiwan. Knowing that the United States is adamantly opposed to their nuclear program, South Korea and Taiwan would therefore preemptively, and the keyword is preemptively, select themselves out of a confrontation, encounter with the United States. That is to say they voluntarily, preemptively, anticipatorily decide not to arm themselves with nuclear weapons. So there's never a need for the, for, for the United States to put pressure to apply influence on South Korea and Taiwan to dissuade them from going nuclear. The United States did not, for example, have to sanction Taiwan and South Korea to, to deter them from arming themselves with nuclear weapons. So what do you ask me? History does not record these instances because the fact that South Korea and Taiwan did not go nuclear were non-events, non-occurrences. What does history then record? What does history report when we have events, events data? What does history record as events data? Only when, for example, a country like North Korea and let's say Iran, decide to go nuclear. And these countries go nuclear or launch their programs knowing that the United States will bring very heavy pressure on them, sanction them with very costly outcomes for them. And yet these countries decide to still go nuclear. So what does that mean? It means that their self-selection means that they were highly resolved and determined. These are precisely the most difficult cases for the United States to get these countries not to go nuclear. So in this sense, then, history is very much biased. It only records those instances when the United States power of pers persuasion or power to sanction do not work or are less likely to work. Whereas the easy cases are never shown up as events in in, in our uh, in our chronicles or chronologies. Then, so yeah, let's just move on because we are. So I'm coming to the end of my intellectual journey, which is still open-ended in the sense that I have not come up with very uh, satisfactory answers myself. Uh, I think uh, we all have to kind of acknowledge that there are lots of issues, problems when we talk about power. Much of it depends on our, on our indicators, which are very fragile and in some cases very problematic. And I myself now are looking at network centrality, network theory, uh, looking at how power can be defined in terms of linkages, linkages and access with the rest of the world, right? Countries that occupy the central position uh, in these networks are more powerful. And without spending more time, uh, I would just recommend a very nice article if you have not come across it yet in International Security, the Journal of International Security by uh, Farrell and Newman, where they talk about how the United States was able to weaponize interdependence. Uh, in a world of interdependent countries, there are many more connections uh, to the extent that the United States, number one, controls information networks, the internet, for example. It has a much better ability to survey, to, to monitor what's happening. And the second thing that they talk about, these authors talk about, is choke points. Uh, specifically, they talk about something that all of you are familiar with. It's the SWIFT code, uh, S-W-I-F-T. For anyone who has sent money abroad or received money from, from another country, you know that this is the only game in town. And because the United States is able to control SWIFT, it is able to choke off, for example, financial transactions from countries like North Korea or Iran. So your centrality in the networks, your ability to control network flows uh, is another source of power. And I'm still trying to come up with some kind of operationalization uh, to pursue this yet another conception of power as 
uh, as centrality in networks. So let me just stop here because I'm already over time. And Kai, you can open the forum for discussion for questions and answers. Thank you.